Well, hi guys. Uh, coastal policy class is going well. I am um, really very happy with what most of you are doing. I know some of you had to drop the class or you're not even seeing this, uh, and I'm sorry about that. But um, where we are going now is, I think, towards the end of the uh, of the semester. Remember, this is a, a four-week uh, semester, which normally would be uh, an entire semester. So that's, you know, pretty impressive uh, that we can get all that work done, but it is a lot of work. I um, want to share with you some uh, stuff that is relevant to the material that we're dealing with now, which is the material from Ocean's End. Remember, oceans, coasts, they're the same thing. They're all interconnected. Uh, and the coasts are just where the ocean kind of slows down and hard surfaces begin. But those, some of those hard surfaces are not uh, doing very well. They're uh, under a lot of pressure. So I wanted to share with you um, how sea level rises uh, are messing with all of this and uh, let's see if this works here. The evidence is in plain sight as coastal cities around the globe bear witness to rising seas that launch ever higher floods, consequences of climbing carbon dioxide levels and decades of global warming. That's now. What about the future? How is sea level rise likely to affect our cities if we continue on the current trend for carbon emissions? It's a trend leading to 4 degrees Celsius of warming above the levels we had a little more than a century ago. It is really daunting and sad to look at what happens if we warm the planet by 4 degrees Celsius. So many great monuments of the world, so many great cities would be below the sea level in that scenario. In our analysis we found that more than half a billion people live on land that would be threatened by four degrees Celsius of warming. And what our research tries to do is put a picture on the numbers. Climate Central's mapping choices uses a variety of visuals to give us a window into how much sea level rise different levels of warming could quickly lock in, though the rise would likely unfold over centuries. What happens after four degrees C warming? versus 2C, the internationally agreed upon target that would require swift and aggressive emission cuts to achieve? Difficult, but not impossible. It's very hard work to get from the 4C path to a 2C path, but it's very much within the capability of each nation on this planet to follow that path. I want people to come away with a sense of the choice that we have. For a future that looks like this, or one that looks more like this. Well, I think you should uh, maybe go to climatecentral.org and take a look at some of the things that they have there. Um, it's very interesting and uh, I have a feeling that you will be surprised at what, at what you find. Thank you. 
the um, I, I wanted to show those to you because I think the average individual um, can't picture what climate change is like. Um, in a place like Iowa, for example, our communities that are on the rivers on both sides of the state, um, farmers and others, uh, really have a hard time visualizing what exactly uh, could happen if temperatures rise and we continue to get disruptive weather and more and more and more rain and, and, and snow and snow melt. And I think imaging, um, you know, a picture maybe uh, is worth a thousand words and certainly uh, we need more pictures so that people will um, understand, take seriously, study, think about and not simply ideologically dismiss the idea, well, climate change, you know, is something that we don't have to worry about. Um, yes, it is a problem, I think, that uh, as they say here, it may take, you know, decades or a hundred years or more for this to come about. And that makes it hard for people now to want to make sacrifices. Uh, and that's why the whole um, struggle to have policy changes, to have uh, climate change conventions and treaties um, respected and acted and forced uh, is so difficult. I just wanted to, you know, underscore that. Okay, we'll see you back in class.